Well, good morning, church. How are we doing? Good. It looks like we all survived the windstorm, huh? Wasn't that something? We've had plenty of wind last year and this year, so hopefully we're done with that for a while and get some sunshine, right? Um, so my name's Sam Spence. Uh, I'm on the teaching team here, uh, and we are currently going through the book of Romans. And our heartbeat during this whole season through this book of Romans is we're saying, we're praying, God, please revive us. We want to see you. We want a full-blown revival. So we're inviting God to join us this morning to revive our spirit so we can have a revival in this community and in this world. So if you have your Bibles with you, well, we're going to be in Romans chapter 3, verses 20 through 31. We're going to get there in just a moment. But now it's time for you to show off your memory verse skills. Are we ready? Yeah, you guys sound ready. Are we ready to show off our memory verse skills? Yeah, baby. All right, let's do it. So here's our memory verse. Let's read this together. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. So we're going to be here today. This is the heartbeat of the first part of Romans here. So before we jump in, how many of y'all like fishing? Oh, yeah, I got some. Oh, yeah. I love fishing. I'll show you afterwards. I'm wearing fish socks. They got little crankbaits on them. All right, so if you want to see some cool socks, come find me. So for me, I love fishing, but I know a lot of people that don't like fishing. Where am I not? I don't like fishing. Okay. Fishing is like either you love it or you hate it. Kind of like blue cheese or olives, black licorice, right? I like to go fishing even when I'm not catching, right? I know some of you in this room like to go fishing to do the catching, to reel them in. But where am I going with this? If you've ever caught a fish, okay, if you've ever had a pet fish, or if you've ever been to an aquarium, you'll notice fish are pretty goofy looking creatures, aren't they? Have you ever stared a fish in the eye? No? <laughs> Next time you're around a fish, do it because their eyes are on the side of their head like this. And what's really crazy in thinking about Romans and what's going on, I started thinking about fish eyes I'll, I'll explain, because fish, they can see 360 degrees on plane. So they can see what's going on back here. So to put that in perspective, each human eye, we can see about 130 degrees per each eye. You add both of them, you can see about 180 degrees, right? So we don't have fish vision. Some of you moms in this room claim you have eyes in the back of your head, <laughs> right? That's a sense, you can't actually see it. So. What's really crazy is fish. They can see 360 degrees, but some species cannot see like three inches in front of their nose. So if we cross our eyes, everybody cross your eyes with me. Stick out your tongue. I'm going to take a picture of y'all. <laughs> so fish can't see their nose. There's a little a dead spot in their vision. So the more you know, right? The more you know. Next time, you're never going to look at a fish the same way. So why are we talking about fish eyes, Okay. What are we doing sticking our tongue out and crossing our eyes? I'll explain. Because I think this is what Paul has been doing through the book of Romans so far. Paul, Paul has been taking his time from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 3 to give us a 360 degree view. Okay, The way this was written, it's giving us a good view of the human condition, our sinfulness. And I know that these past few weeks, they've been really, really good, but they've been really, really deep, right? It's very, very good stuff. And this is my opinion. I believe Romans is written in this way because God doesn't want us dealing with our sinful nature in a shallow way. God wants us to look around 360 degrees to acknowledge our brokenness, to acknowledge our sinfulness, to acknowledge the severity of sin and how our actions, our sins, affect us on judgment day. So I view Romans as fish vision, right? So that's been our goal. As we've been going through Romans so far, God wants to bring us to a place where we can reflect, we can see the whole picture, to remember our sinfulness, to be grateful for what Jesus did on the cross, to realize, to fully realize the weight of what Jesus did on the cross. We have to look around and see our life our brokenness, our sinfulness, 360 degrees. Because a lot of times, church, myself included, we like to think better of ourselves than we should. We're great at comparing ourselves to other people. We're like, whoa, 
I'm way, I'm way better than him because he, whew, he does that. But in, in reality, we need to look because we are all sinfulness. We talked, full of sinfulness. We talked about this last week. And let me tell you, if you did not watch last week's message, you did not hear it, your number one thing you need to do today is right after this sermon, I want you to watch another sermon, okay? Or maybe you could wait till tomorrow. But if you missed last week's sermon, you need to watch it this week because our, our messages are gonna go together. And that, sir, that was a great reminder for me. How many of you guys were blessed by last week's message? Raise your hands. Absolutely, praise God. Okay, that was an amazing message. But last week, I was reminded of my sinfulness. I was reminded that I often think more of myself than I should. And I, I was humbled last week. And the cool thing is, I got to eat some humble pie this week too, right? Because God reminded me again this week that, you know what, Sam, you're not all that. How many of you guys have ever had a really busy day? Like, uh, I need my coffee and I need my Jesus and I need a miracle, right? I had one of these days, and it, it, I think it was Monday, but I was running behind. I needed to get to work, and it was one of those days where I was like, I'll just get coffee at work. So it was already not starting off good, right? So I come into my office, and I've got a mountain of mugs, because a whole side sermon, I never bring my mugs home. So I've got a mountain of mugs, and some are dirty and gross, and so I'm going through the pile, and I find one, my favorite mug, and it's clean. It looks clean, right? I was like, oh, I can use this. So I grab it, I go into the break room. The coffee's already done, praise God. I needed that coffee. So I, I run over, I'm talking to a coworker, I'm multitasking, I take my lid off, I pour the coffee in. I'm like, yeah, this is gonna be good, put the lid on, finish my conversation, go back to my desk. So minutes later, I got my lid on my coffee, I take my first sip, and I was like, this coffee's not great, right? This, I've had better coffee in my life. So I start, I open my email, start, phone starts ringing, take another sip, and I'm like, tastes like chemicals, right? Yeah, this don't, this don't taste good. So I put it down. I was like, maybe the next sip will be better. I don't know why. The third sip, I get a little texture. Yep, so there's some texture in my coffee, and it wasn't coffee grounds. And I'm like, all right, what's this chemical textury stuff? So I pull off my lid. I see some, some mold floating right on top of my coffee right? The cup that I thought was clean was filthy, dirty, moldy, rotten on the inside. In that moment, I'm like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you for the reminder that so often I pride myself in being clean and holy and righteous on the outside, but on the inside, I am still broken. I am still a sinner. Let's look at what Matthew 22, 25 through 28 says. It says, woe to you teachers of the law. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, the people that think better about themselves than other people. He says, you hypocrites, like he's going all out. You clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but the inside, they're full of greed, self-indulgence. You're full of mold on the inside. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He's still going all out. Verse 28. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Wow. I needed that reminder last Sunday, and apparently I needed it again the next day on Monday, right? So what are we being told to do? The dishes, right? Wives, you can't use this as your, for your husbands to honey. You see in Scripture it says do the dishes. We're not talking about those kind of dishes. We're talking about the dishes being you, your life. God wants us to clean up our insides, to be aware of the rottenness, the mold, the greed, the sin that is inside of us. Because we have to understand our sinfulness, our brokenness inside of us before the weight of what Jesus actually did can be felt. Last week, Tim, Tim said, all that are guilty, all that are sinners, stand up. And guess what? Everybody in this church stood up because all are guilty, all are sinful and fall short of the glory of God. We have to recognize and acknowledge our brokenness, our sinfulness, our rotten, rotten core. When we get to Romans chapter three, verses 21 through 26, or, or two, two, through 31, 
This is the greatness of what God has done. We cannot process the weight of what Jesus did until we recognize our need, our sinfulness, our brokenness. So again, I'm plugging last week. If you missed last week, you need to go back and watch it. Because if the, if the book of Romans ended where it did last week at verse 20, it would, be, it would be game over for man. But two important words start what we're talking about today, and these words are but now. Because this isn't the end of the story. Our brokenness, our sinfulness, our moldy, rotten core is not the end of the story because all those things deserve death. But now, Scripture says, the story goes on because God enters the story a just and righteous God is what we're going to be talking about this morning. So if you are able this morning, church, let's stand to our feet, pull out your Bibles. We're going to be in Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. I'll put it on the screen here. And I'm going to read this, and you can follow along. Scripture says this, But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify, This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those to have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith for we maintain that a person is justified by a part from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. So while we're standing, let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. God, I thank you for this word. God, we invite you here this morning. Speak through me, God. Please speak into all all of our lives, God. Make your presence known, God. We want want revival in our spirit, God. We want revival in this church and in this community, God. So bless our time together. Help me to communicate your word this morning. It's in your son's name, amen. Y'all can have a seat. So as we're reading through Romans here, there's a phrase used a number of times five times to be exact. It's this phrase, righteousness of God. This is what we're going to be talking about today. And that's at least the plan. All right, we'll see where the Spirit leads us this morning. But we're going to have a couple main points. In keeping with the theme of Romans, these are going to be deep points. Okay, you're going to find out a lot of what we're talking about today could be its own sermon in itself. So we've got a lot of material to get through today. So if you've got your notes, go ahead and get them out. We're going to jump into our first main point, and it is this. God is righteous and just. Write this down. We're going to spend a lot of time on this one. Because we see in verse 21, it says, But now apart from the law... The righteousness of God has been revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, but it is the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. God is a righteous and he is a just God. Psalm 89, 15 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Steadfast love and faithfulness go before you. We're reading characteristics of God. Another one in Deuteronomy 32, 4 describes God this way. The rock, his work is perfect. For all of his ways are just, justice, a God of faithfulness and without inequity. He is just and upright, is he. So we see God countless times throughout scripture, righteous and just. So we're gonna be in the courtroom again today, 
Okay, this is why last week's message is important. So who's ready to go to court? Order, order. That's ringing. That's loud, right? So we were in the courtroom last week. We introduced this theme, okay? So last week we talked about when this life is over, we are going to stand before the judge, okay? Before the king being God. And last week we focused on people entering the courtroom. You would call them defendants or those that are having to defend themselves, right? If you're familiar with the legal system. So we talked about three people, three groups of people, the godless, the wicked, and the self-righteous, okay? The people that were coming before God on trial, okay? So scripture says, just to review, all of us, we're going to stand before God when this life is over. If Jesus comes back or, or we die, God is a righteous and he is a just God, So using this courtroom as an illustration, we are looking at the judge, and that judge is God. So this morning, we are looking at characteristics of God. So in doing so, okay, we're seeing that God is righteous and just. And here's another opportunity or or another thing I want to talk about because we could do a whole sermon on this word righteousness, okay, what that means, what it's talking about, and we could also do a whole other sermon on what does a just God look like. Okay, so it's my goal to steward our time well because we have a lot to unpack here. So we're going to break down these two words, and I want to start talking about what does the Bible mean when it describes God as righteous? So this word righteousness, what does it mean? And I'm going to give you two definitions. This first one is for me, okay, and hopefully it's for you too because this is the simplest way I can make it. God is righteous, but the simple version is God is right. Okay? I love that because the word right is in righteous. That means God is always right. In all his judgment and all his decisions, he is always right. That's about as simple as we can make it. But I've got another definition if you're good with words and you have a, a big, big noggin, right? Real smart. Here's a, here's a good one. I can't claim this one. Okay? I found this on the inter- internet and I love it. So, Here's another version of God's righteousness. God is morally and ethically right, keeping to what is right and just. This last part's awesome. He is consistent with his own character. We have a God that doesn't contradict himself, okay? Now, I want us to clarify something, to consider something, because in a moment, we're going to be talking about righteousness that we get from God if we are Christ followers, justification we get from God when we accept him, God is on a whole different level, y'all, okay? We're like down here and God's up here. We will never reach this level of righteousness because no human can be justified and righteous in a way that God can. Because God's level of holiness, God is so holy. Do you guys, have you ever read through like the Old Testament before? Yeah, there's a lot of laws, right? Right? If you remember the Old Testament law, God had established a system through which man was provided a way to approach him because he was so holy. There had to be a process, there had to be a system so humans could even approach God. So if you read through the book of Leviticus and you're scratching your head, the reason why there's so many rules and laws, the reason it was so complicated was because God God is so holy. There had to be a process. People could not be in his presence. God is that holy. Man was not righteous enough to be in his presence, so they had to go through this system. Because God is so righteous, he is morally and ethically right, and he is consistent with his own character, because God is so holy. We're talking about the characteristics of God. We serve a holy God, a loving God, a merciful God, a gracious God, a righteous God, and a just God. And God ha- God's justice has to be satisfied. That way, that's why when you read the old law, animals were sacrificed. Because sin, the cost of sin was death, so a perfect animal had to be killed to satisfy God's justice. God is righteous even in his justness. So I want to look at this second word. We're doing pretty good on time. This is good. God is just. Here's what that means. God is perfectly righteous in the treatment of his creation. We're going to spend some time here. You notice these two words go together? The definition of 
justness has righteousness in it? Pretty cool. God is just, which means he is consistent. He's innocent. He's always right. God is just. He is the righteous judge in all he does. Because when God gives a verdict, when he sits at the judge's seat, he is consistent with his own character. He is right. He is just. He is perfect. Okay, don't take my word for it. Let's look at Deuteronomy 32.4. We're reading about the character of God, our judge, our, our father. It says, He is the rock. His works are perfect. All And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. Let's look at Acts 17.31, I think is next. For he has set a day when, when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Our God is just. I think the last one's in Job, amazing book of Job. It is unthinkable that God would do anything wrong, that the Almighty would pervert justice. We serve a just and righteous God in all he does, in every decision he makes. But what's crazy is we get such a clear definition of, in Scripture about this character of God, but we as humans, we still struggle with this idea of what does a righteous and what does a just God look like. Think about that. It's hard for me to understand sometimes what a just God looks like. Because I have my own idea of what fair is, right? Of what just looks like. Each of us in here, we have our own opinions about justice. We, and oftentimes we like to see it in our own terms. Don't want to skip ahead. So let me give you an example about this idea of justice. So imagine that Adolf Hitler, okay, had been found alive hiding in Germany and was brought before a judge and read his crimes, okay? His crimes took nine hours to read, but at the end of this, this trial, the judge goes, hmm, I see what you've done. You've murdered millions of people, caused war, but I think you've learned your lesson. I'm gonna let you go, not guilty. Sorry, I woke some people up. Can you imagine what would happen? People would be mad, right? Because you have this mass murderer who was on trial. The jury had already decided they wanted to kill him because death would have been the deserving penalty for the crimes he committed. This would have been a major injustice. People would say his evil requires death or an evil punishment. People long after justice. Everybody has their own idea of what justice looks like. Let's look at one in scripture. <clears throat> Remember the woman that was caught in adultery? They were drug, she was drug out into the streets and people said, what are we going to do with her? There has to be justice for her actions. So they brought her to Jesus' feet. These people, they were demanding that Jesus give an answer. Do we kill her? We've got all the rocks. Let's just do it. Let's stone her. And then Jesus said, let any of you who is out without sin throw the first stone at her. And those that heard this, they, they began to go away one at a time until it was just Jesus left with this woman, this woman standing there and he straightened up and asked this woman, he said, woman, where are, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she goes, no, sir, not one. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, now go and leave your life of sin. I'm gonna bang the gavel, not to scare anybody. Not guilty. As humans, we have this tension we need to be aware of. As we go through life, we are going to see injustice happen. We are going to want justice to happen. And you know why? It's because we're created in God's image. We inherit this from our creator. Let's talk about fish again, okay? I have never, I've caught a lot of fish, not to brag, but I have never met a fish chase justice for me catching him and eating his friends, right? I have never released a fish back in the water and he swims to his other fish and be like, this was a major injustice against me. I will not tolerate it. Have you guys ever seen fish school together and come back and get you because you caught their friend and ate them? No. Fish are not created in God's image. We as humans are created in God's image. So therefore, 
we're going to recognize injustice. We're going to see injustice. We're going to have a, a bit of justness that we inherit from our Creator because our God is a just and righteous God. So I want to I want to show this in Scripture in First King, First Kings three twenty eight. Did I skip a point? No. Okay. This is one. God is righteous and just. We were just coming back to that. So this is First Kings uh, three twenty eight. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. We're talking about King Solomon at this time. He was given wisdom to discern justice. He was given wisdom in justness from God because we are created in God's image. When we ask Jesus into our life, he gives us a little bit of righteousness. He gives us wisdom to be just, to discern. So this is a tension we live in because we're going to go through life, we're going to see injustice happen. Okay, And we see in Scripture how we're supposed to deal with those to help people, right? We desire justice, but we as humans, we are not just beings. We do not have the wisdom and discernment that God has. We are not completely just. We are not perfect in our decision-making. All this to say is we cannot be just like God. God is on a whole different level. He's, he's out of our league in this department. So let's keep looking at what righteousness and justness look, looks like. And I think a good way to do this is to look in Scripture about how God deals with people, you know? How is God a just God? So let's, let's go all the way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. Do we remember Adam and Eve? Mm-hmm. I hope so, right? Started there. Adam and Eve sinned. Okay, that's what started this whole thing, right? And their crime, I guess, wouldn't seem so bad on an earthly standard. They just, like, disobeyed God, right? Like, he told them not to eat that fruit, and they did it anyway. Like, maybe we would sweep that sin under the rug. But think about it from God's viewpoint. Think about it from heaven's viewpoint. We have a righteous and a just God, creator, ruler of everything, He's, he's the Lord of angel armies, worthy of all adoration, worship, and love, and he's defiled by man. Literally a creation he made from the dirt in the dust committed treason against him. Justice demanded action. You see, if God overlooked, or he's just like, oh, it's okay, he excused that crime, that treason would not be just because God is just, because God cannot make a rule, establish the penalty, and not follow through. That's not a just God. He had a way to satisfy justice without destroying human beings, and that was Jesus. Because we know that justice required the death penalty for high treason, for sin. The same is true with us. Our sins deserve death. But we know a substitute was brought in to satisfy the demands of God's justice. A beautiful, flawless animal was killed instead. We see that in the old law. An animal had to die. And we know the story goes on, and we just talked about it. Thousands of years later, justice was satisfied once and for all when God sent his son Jesus, his own son, into the world to be our substitute to die on the cross, the perfect lamb without blemish was killed. And in that moment, justice of sin was satisfied when Jesus died on the cross. He hung on that cross for the sins of all humanity because our God is a just God and justice had to be satisfied. So therefore, point number one, all that to say, God is a righteous and just God in all he does. Whew! Deep breath, right? Who's ready for point two? Here we go, moving on. God's righteousness is available equally to everybody. Okay, I'm going to plug last week again because it was so good. We talked a lot about this last week. It's available to everybody, right? Last week, we talked about these three groups of people. We had the the godless, the wicked, and the self-righteous. 
we learned at the end of the sermon last week that all three of these people had something in common. They, they didn't think they did. But all of them were sinners and fell short of the glory of God. All of them were guilty, deserving death, standing before the judge, our God. Because all of us, the wicked, the godless, even the self-righteous, we're all bound, to, to, bound as slaves to sin, but God turned that all around, and he gave us Jesus as an option. You see, when Jesus died on the cross, he's, he's taken your death, he's turned it to life. He's taken your sorrow, he's turned it to joy. He's taken your darkness and turned it into light. He's taken your failure and turned it into victory. So God's righteousness is available to everyone equally through a relationship with, with Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus died on the cross, he freely gives us righteousness to people that accept him. Not to be self-righteous, but so we can approach him, so making the old law obsolete. So now, if you accept Jesus, you can stand before God righteous and justified on that judgment day. Because no longer does that old law exist. Jesus became that perfect lamb who died once and for all for all of our sins. When you stand before God, you can be justified in righteousness if you accept Jesus into your life. It's nothing you can earn. It's nothing you can buy. You were guilty in the court of law, deserving of death, but Jesus took your punishment on that cross because God is righteous and just. And his righteousness is available equally to everyone. Church, that's good news. Amen? Amen. Because you know what that means? That means you are never too far gone. You are never too bad for a relationship with Jesus. He will welcome you with open arms wherever you are. And when you stand before that judge at the end of life, you will be justified and righteous because of what God did for you through a relationship with Jesus. It's available equally to everyone. We're going to have an opportunity here in a little bit. If you haven't experienced God this way, if you haven't asked Jesus into your life, there's going to be an opportunity to do that, to come and pray with somebody this morning. So if you're feeling that, Please don't leave here without praying with someone. Let's look at verses uh, 23 through 24 again. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It says it again, right? We are, all, we are all justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. We're going to talk about this word grace, okay? If you've got your notes with you, you're going to see something that looks um, or we're going to fill that in first. How about that? Does that sound good? <laughs> so we know what we're talking about. All right. Now I think we're going to get to the acronym. There's verse 24. Again, sorry, I'm a little out of order. That's all right. So you're going to have this acronym, and here's what this means. Okay, this is the definition of grace we're going to close on today. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. This is what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Because when, when we accept Jesus into our life, when we are saved, when we accept this gift of salvation, we become justified and righteous through his grace. And that grace being God's riches at Christ's expenses. So what does this mean for us, church? Because all of us, we're going to stand before this judge. Our sins are going to be read off. We'll be standing in that courtroom. You have a decision to make. Are you going to receive Jesus? Are you going to stand before the judge, righteous and just? Because God has made us righteous and just at Christ's expense. And that's the gospel message. You have been justified by grace. You have been made right by God's grace. So we're going we're gonna to sing a song 
in a moment, and worship team, you can make your way backstage. We're going to move into a time of reflection and prayer. And as we approach this time, I encourage us to look back at our life. Use your fish vision, right? Look back at your life, 360 degrees, and acknowledge your brokenness. Acknowledge I am sinful at my core. I don't deserve what Jesus did, but I am so thankful. Or maybe you're here this morning and you're like me and you sometimes think of yourself higher than you should. I would challenge you during this time, humble yourself. Look back and say, you know what? I may look pretty on the outside, but I am still wicked. I am still rotten in, in my core. Get right with God this morning. Because all sin costs something. And Jesus paid for that sin. If you're here this morning and you have not accepted Jesus into your life, if you have yet to pray and ask God to come into your life, please take this opportunity to do so. I'll be standing down here behind this screen. Uh, somebody will be over here, either Nikki or Jim. Come find somebody. Our prayer team's available. So if we get a little backed up, it's fine. If you want to experience this grace that we're talking about this morning, if you want to find true freedom in God, please come pray with somebody. All you have to do is ask. It's not a special prayer from a special person. It's you saying, Jesus, come into my life. Or maybe this morning you just need prayer. We want this to be a time where if you need prayer, you can come get prayer. We're available to pray for you. We, we, we've been praying for you. So if you need something, please come see us and we would love to place our hands and, and pray over you. So church, let's get ready to worship. Are you ready? Let's, let, let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for this word you've given us this morning. God, I thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross so we could be righteous and justified in your presence, God. God, please be with us. Please help us to reflect, to look back on our life, to, to acknowledge our brokenness, our sinfulness, God. Please let us feel the weight of what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. God, we love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's respond, church.